Good morning. Thank you for joining us for County Executive Stuart Pittman's second virtual town hall on COVID-19 in Anne Arundel County. This morning, we're going to discuss what actions the county government is taking during this emergency. And we're joined by our state and federal partners, Congressman Anthony Brown, State Senator Sarah Elfrith, and they're going to report on the state and the federal response. We're going to begin with each of them coming to the podium and giving us a three minute opening statement. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I just wanna first explain why we're doing this. Obviously, uh, it's important to communicate right now. Um, not only do we need to give you all the information that we can about what your government is doing uh, in this time, but we need to hear from you. So uh, I hope that you, if, you're, if you're on Facebook, we're watching your comments as they come in and questions, um, and we've also gotten some email questions in advance. Uh, so uh, let's get this started. The, um, the current situation globally is uh, numbers are continuing to rise as expected. Uh, 276,000 positives and 11,399 as of last night deaths globally. In the U.S., 263 deaths, 19,643 positive cases. In the state, 149 positive cases as of last night. And uh, we had our second death um, of a Baltimore County man. The first was a Prince George's County man in the state of Maryland. And our hearts go out to their families. In the county, uh, we have 14, 15, if you count, count the part-time resident, positive cases, um, and um, uh, fortunately have not yet had our first fatality. Uh, the point is that this is serious, and the infection rate uh, is estimated in most countries. They're, they're projecting that it get up over 50% of the population, um, and this is a virus with a death rate um, projected to be in the two to three percent range. So you can do your own math on that, but in a county of 600,000 people, we're talking about um, some major, major stress on our healthcare system. And that's the reason why we're doing all of this work to what they say, flatten the curve, to slow the, the growth, um, slow down the process so that our healthcare system can handle the people who, who are coming in and who are sick. Um, so, government exists to protect the people it serves. We pay our taxes and we expect government to deliver at times like this. And I do want to say that we have some good things to report on that front. Um, and I'm very glad that I have with me Congressman Brown and Senator Elfrith uh, because they've been working at the state and federal levels and, and uh, it's, been, it's been heartening to see how um, elected officials have um, you know, put their politics aside and addressed the issues that we're facing. Um, so <clears throat> I also want to say that I have a daily telephone call with the seven county executives that are in central Maryland. They call us the big seven. It's about 75% of the population of the state and over 90% of the positive cases in the state. And we talk every day about what each of us are doing and we communicate with the governor's team uh, based on those calls. Um, our former county executive, Steve Shu, has been assigned by Governor Hogan to be the liaison with the counties on this. And so it's good to have somebody who's been in our shoes um, working together with us on this. In Anne Arundel County, government is doing good things, but I don't want to sugarcoat what's actually happening in our communities. I've spent most of the week listening and it's very clear to me that people are hurting already. Uh, as is the case with every economic hit to the American economy, it's the hourly workers who barely make enough to pay their bills who get hit the hardest, and this is no different. Uh, restaurants and hotels are already laying people off. Uh, some of those businesses are hanging in there, marketing and serving carry-out meals. I had a fantastic dinner last night from Chad's Barbecue in Edgewater. And um, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but it did come with a bottle of Jack Daniels and some very, very good whiskey sour mix. 
Um, so please, please support these local businesses. They need us and their, employer, and their employees need us. Uh, unemployment claims are already spiking in our county. We had 1,851 last week, and we expect that number to increase quickly. Um, Senator Elfrith will talk about some of the good work that's been done at the state level um, to make it easier to get those claims approved. Um, parents, particularly single parents who are self-employed or who work hourly with no benefits, are losing income already, uh, staying home with their kids. So bills won't get paid, debt will grow, and this is likely to become the greatest economic challenge of our generation. But still, we must and we will focus on what matters, which is our health, our family's health, our neighbor's health. And uh, for county government, there is a good story to tell about the work that's being done uh, and the response. Um, so this week, we opened up our emergency operations center, which is where I am right now in Glen Burnie. Um, partial activation overseen by Chief uh, Tim Michaels and uh, Deputy Director Preeti Emmerich. Um, in order to make sure that the work that comes out of the Emergency Operations Center is completely coordinated with everything that we're doing in county government, I've assigned our Deputy CAO, Matt Power, uh, to coordinate the efforts here on our behalf, and our Deputy CAO, Kay Bodges to Brown, um, who always works with the Health and Human Service Agencies, is going to be working with him to coordinate the response to help the most vulnerable populations of our county, uh, the people, and how they're actually being affected. Um, the EOC is open seven days a week, and the phone number here is 410-222-0600. And the email here is eoc at aacounty.org. So here in the EOC, we have uh, what we call the Joint Information Center as well. Um, it's the public information officers from the, the agencies that have been activated, um, overseen by our PIO, Roz Hamlet, uh, who's moderating this, this uh, event today. Um, we have a phone bank here at the EOC. Initially, all calls were going to the health department, but a lot of the questions that were being raised were things that other agencies besides the health department do. So you can still call that number, but if you call the, e e the EOC number, uh, you'll also be sent to the health department if it's a health question. Um, we have our community engagement and constituent service staff from the county executive's office helping demand those phones, as well as staff from all the agencies of the county uh, taking shifts uh, to answer those calls. We're at about 300 calls a day right now, and we expect that number to increase uh, rapidly. Um, so my whole staff in the county executive's office has new jobs. Uh, the new job descriptions, um, we're fully integrating with the EOC, which is essential. We meet daily, uh, and um, most of us are working remotely with a few exceptions. Um, the EOC has established a logistical staging area for supplies and equipment and has received its first allotment already from the Strategic National Stockpile this week. Uh, private donations, uh, of which we have had some some wonderful donations uh, you can make through the EOC at the number 222 <clears throat> um, I want to especially thank Pasadena Boat Works for the 14,095 face masks that they, they donated this week. Thank you both Nick and Rick. And also Weaver Boat Works in Deal has donated 1,000 boxes of gloves and 10,095 masks. So thank you Ashley and Jim and the whole Weaver family uh, in South County. Um, if you would like to donate, uh, you can uh, donate financially uh, to a new fund that's been created through the Community Foundation of Anne Arundel County. Um, you can access that through the county website or at cfaac.org. Um, on the issue of testing, I know there's going to be a lot of discussion about this, and I'm going to leave that to Dr. Callie Naroman, our health officer, who's going to speak after me. But some of the other agencies and the work that they're doing are worth noting. In the transportation department, we are operating fare free for public transit, um, but the governor has, has discouraged people from using public transit except for essential trips. We obviously don't want large numbers of people on the buses. Uh, the rec and parks department has waived fees in our parks and kept them open, but they have closed playgrounds now and all the buildings are closed uh, in the parks. And of course, the recreation programs 
and child care services through the Rec and Parks Department have been suspended. Um, but we are working to get uh, child care organized for essential employees uh, this, this coming week. We're going to get that started. In economic development, uh, the, uh, the team there is checking in with local businesses on a regular basis, taking calls, hearing about people's needs and concerns. Uh, we did get designated by the federal government um, to do the um, SBA emergency loans, uh, and they're going to be at economic development taking, taking those applications for and, and helping guide people through that process. Uh, in central services, our team there is on the phone six, eight hours a day calling, calling vendors, trying to get supplies. Um, one one um, uh, real positive note from there is uh, an agreement with the Gray Wolf Distillery on the Eastern Shore, uh, owned by an Anne Arundel County resident, um, to provide 130 gallons a week, we, we expect, um, of hand sanitizer in one ounce and gallon bottles. Um, and those are going to be brought here to the EOC and distributed as needed. Um, the police department is on the street uh, watching what's going on, hearing uh, firsthand on the front lines um, how people are responding. And uh, how the, the story that I'm hearing is that in, for the most part, people, people are doing the social distancing that they've been asked to do, uh, and gatherings of 10 or more people um, are not happening in most cases. When they do see them, however, um, they, they intervene and they ask people to disperse. Um, I do want to note that there have been some examples where people did not want to disperse. Uh, Sawmill Park basketball court, both last night and the night before, were challenging situations for the police. Um, they ended up turning off the lights there last night when people would not disperse. Um, but we don't want to be in a situation where we're putting people in our jails uh, because they are refusing uh, to comply with the, uh, the order uh, to... Um, to limit gatherings to 10 people or less. Our fire department is on the front lines. Uh, most of their calls are always EMS calls. Uh, so they're out there. Their staffing is absolutely essential. So we're trying to protect those employees. They're at the highest risk as they serve our front lines um, in our homes often um, as health professionals and get people to the hospital when they need to be be brought there. Our law offices, uh, they worked on our emergency declaration, which was extended uh, yesterday by our county council. Uh, there's, there's work on executive orders to get rid of the red tape, cut through the red tape so that we can act quickly uh, to get things done um, in county government. Uh, in the personnel department, we're, we're taking care of our people the best we can. We're providing administrative leave for folks who can't work. Um, we're loosening some of those requirements, um, but uh, if you're an accounting employee, you, you've, you've received messages about this already. You need to work with your supervisors to figure out whether you're going to be working at home um, and what your situation is going to be. Um, but we're going to cover everybody financially for the time that they're not able to work. Uh, our schools have done a great job of getting the 52 sites that they opened. I think we were quicker than any other, uh, any other county in the state in terms of the numbers of school meal sites. Uh, 52, and then they announced another nine yesterday. Um, there are parts of the county that we feel are not as well served by that, and we're looking for additional sites right now, working with the school system on that. Um, our libraries are doing digital digital um, loans still, so you can go to the Anne Arundel County Library's website and can, and uh, um, and borrow uh, digital digital um, books and. Uh, and tapes and all, all sorts of things there. And there are also online activities there for kids. Um, aging and disabilities has been nothing short of heroic. I think that's one of the reasons that I'm wearing their, their fleece today. Uh, they're making phone calls to every senior in Anne Arundel County that they know of that, that uses their services every week and asking how they're doing. And some they're calling daily when they request it. They're also providing meals to seniors where they can come pick them up at the senior centers. Um, our, obviously, our social service department is is um, got a lot of work uh, uh, just signing people up for benefits, but they've also been working with our homeless shelters, uh, going in and helping them figure out how to do the distancing that they need to do, moving some of the residents out and into hotels, as also locating sites for isolation and quarantine, working with the rest of our staff. Um, our mental health agency crisis response teams are continuing to be engaged. Partnership for Children, Youth, and Families is working with churches and nonprofits to address the gaps in services, and also working with our team um, to identify uh, a way to 
um, get emergency county funds out uh, where, where needs are not being met. Um, inspections and permits is still doing ins uh, inspections for construction sites. They're not doing in-home inspections right now. Plan and zoning is continuing to do their work, limiting community meetings. The, ge the, the general development plan that we've been working on is likely to be delayed as a part of this project, uh, as a part of uh, this crisis, uh, because it requires public input that can't be, can't make, isn't possible right now. Um, and then in public works, our heroes are continuing to keep our water and wastewater treatment facilities going, um, keeping our roads clear, uh, and. Um, and then finally, our budget office, this is budget season, and we are a attempting to keep up. We, we've, we've slowed our schedule a little bit on reviewing budget proposals from every department, but they are constantly looking at the projections. Um, there's no question in anybody's mind that revenues are gonna be decreasing in the coming year as people take this economic hit. So um, they are helping us uh, figure out where we're gonna stand um, in terms of our budget for next year as we do this. Um, finally, I want to, um, to remind people that it's census time, and when this is all over, uh, we will need the federal government to have an accurate count of our population, and that is something that you can do. Watch for your census code in the mail and respond right away, either online, by phone, or by mail. The, the resources that we get from the federal government in the future will depend on a complete count of Anne Arundel County residents. Um, so I want to personally thank every Anne Arundel County public servant. Um, people are relying on you, and everywhere I look, I see you eagerly stepping up to serve the people of this county, whether it's part of your job or not. Uh, so thank you for that. And for the, the rest of you, um, the uncertainty of this moment naturally creates anxiety. Uh, that's how our brains are wired. So please put that anxiety to work. Help how you can be vigilant about social distancing, protect your family and neighbors, but also take care of yourself. Breathe. Allow yourself to find pleasure where you can. Watch the trees bloom, read some good books, talk to people, and most importantly, listen to people. We're all in this together, everywhere in the world, and we will learn from this, and we will recover together. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, we're glad that you're joining us this morning. I'm Dr. Nilesh Kalyan Raman, the Health Officer for Anne Arundel County. Um, and I want to go over just a few things that we have always been talking about. We are, as a, as, a, as a health department, we're always thinking about public health and how we reinforce our messaging. I uh, want to clarify that the symptoms of COVID-19 that you should be looking for are cough, a fever, and shortness of breath. And what we're finding is that, that that shortness of breath is probably the most specific to COVID-19. If you think about cold symptoms, those are more along the lines of sneezing, runny nose. Um, and so trying to distinguish between whether you have a cold, the flu, or COVID-19 is really hard. And a lot of people are struggling with that. Um, and we're struggling with that in the healthcare system. So. Just think about what those symptoms are, and if you have any questions, you can always call the health department. As the county executive noted, um, the health department is still answering those calls and so much more, which the EOC is doing. Um, social distancing is really critical. Uh, it may seem like it's it may seem like it's not that important, and the question we get is how can I, how can my action be so important? But it is. Everything about this virus that we are doing now is focused on slowing it down. There is no vaccine at this time. There's work being done on treatments, but there are no treatments available at this time that are effective. And so what we have is our own individual actions and our government actions to slow down the spread of this virus. Why are we doing that? We're doing that to make sure of two things. One, the slower it goes, the better our healthcare system is gonna be able to respond to this. Think back to just a few days ago when you go to the grocery store and the aisles are empty because everybody went there at once. Now imagine if we do that to our hospitals, that is a dangerous situation. And so as much as we're trying to increase our capacity in our hospitals, we also have to take steps, each and every one of us, to decrease the need to do that. 
And so that's why the social distancing that we're talking about is critical. Making sure that you stay six feet apart from each other, making sure that if you're still working or a student that you're teleworking or doing it remotely so those interactions are fewer. We all have people who we interact with in our daily lives still, but making sure that you limit that circle of people and keep it constant. One of the things that we used to do is we would come into contact with new people or a large circle of people. We have to close that down. Those are the steps that you can take. And each one of those steps decreases our risk. And it's hard. We're not used to thinking about every single action we take. And that is what we're asking you to do. Think about every single action that you take. It's hard to shift your attention to that, but that is where we are. At the same time, think about your wellness and think about your mental health. This is a hard environment to be in. My wife and I were just talking about two weeks ago if we could even imagine where we are today. That seems like centuries ago. And so thinking about what are, what are ways that you can, as Candy Tech have noted, find pleasure in life. Going outside into the open air is great. That's why our parks are open and free now. Um, looking at reading a book, staying in touch by phone or video with friends and family. Video games. You don't hear me pitching video games often, but they're actually a great way to stay entertained. And for those of you who do it online, to connect with others as well. There are a lot of other options. Think, think through what you enjoy and put some time into that because that's where we are for the next, not just weeks, but months as this crisis unfolds. Testing is always a question that comes up, so I'm gonna talk about it now. I'm happy to answer questions later, but the key block in testing is that there, there aren't enough tests that were approved at the federal level. There are a lot of companies working on that. Exemptions are being granted as we speak. Some of the numbers in Maryland that you see around testing um, with increased numbers uh, in different counties is reflective of increased testing capacity coming online. It's going to be coming online in patchwork, but it's coming online. We, uh, we at the health department and in this county are working on multiple strategies to increase our testing capacity. One, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, but, we're work but we are going to be able to test at congregate sites and we are working with MDH and our hospital partners to stand up drive-through testing sites as well uh, with the hope that this week we will have at least one drive-through testing site available in the county. In terms of what we are focusing on, we've talked a lot about what everybody can do, what are the steps people can take, but there's also a special obligation to, to care for our vulnerable populations, to make sure that we are taking care of them. Those are, the, those are the populations who, in good times, need additional care and resources. And in trying times like these, we need to pay even closer attention to them. We're working with our homeless, uh, homeless care providers uh, and, and partners at DSS and the Partnership for Children, Youth, and Families, Central Services, many others, to do a few things. One, provide better housing for those who are homeless, including individual units. Having people congregated together is not a good idea in a, in a time of a pandemic break, outbreak. We're also working on uh, implementing screening protocols, um, making sure that people who come for, uh, come for shelter are able to get into housing. Um, as many unsheltered people as we have in this county, and the last count was over 60, um, they are very vul vulnerable, and we need to be taking care of them looking at congregate housing. So those are situations in which there are multiple people living in a facility, things like assisted living, residential treatment programs, homeless shelters. How are we making sure that we're keeping those populations safe? And so as of today, the health department is standing up a, a strike team is what we're calling it. It's a team that can, go, that can go out to any one of these facilities, test somebody who, who has symptoms consistent with COVID, and to provide isolation and quarantine advice and solutions for those congregate housing facilities so that we can address those needs as they are happening and not wait for an outbreak. 
working to identify what we can do to care for the uninsured, not just for their COVID-19 needs, but also for other health needs that oftentimes go unaddressed. Uh, working, with, uh, working with our aging and disabilities department, and they're doing an amazing job and looking at what more we can do to augment that. And then paying partic particular uh, attention to our healthcare workers and emergency responders. We're in the beginning of this, um, but this is a long road. I've been talking to my staff about the fact that we can only work so many hours a day um, for so many weeks before we can't continue that pace. And so we're going to be pulling in more people to this response, but we need to be aware that as the, as the workload uh, escalates on those groups, we need to think about how we can make that sustainable. And then lastly, I want to talk about this as a public health issue. This is a classic public health issue where each of our actions are incremental. Each of them helps to, helps to improve the situation. We've talked about this in, in, the, in the setting of how do we prevent disease, how do we prevent cancer, but right now we have to take rapid action. And so we're working on our educational activities. How do we make sure that we get the message ar out around what to do? How do we provide guidances to folks? So if you have any ideas that you think are helpful, please send them to us. We, in this time, are not interacting with the public as much as we used to. And so all of us up here need you to be proactive about letting us know what you're seeing and what you're thinking so that we can better serve you in this time. I'm going to turn it over to Congressman Anthony Brown at this time. Thank you, Doctor, and thank you, uh, County Executive uh, Pittman, for your leadership. Uh, I do want to say at the outset that um, I am exceedingly impressed by the leadership of our county executives, our County Executive Pittman, also Brooke in Prince George County, our governor, Governor Hogan, and state and local leaders around the country who've really stepped up uh, in this effort. Uh, I'm here today as one of the four members of Congress that represent a portion of Anne Arundel County, as do Representatives Hoyer, uh, Sarbanes, and Rupesberger. And I want to first just assure you that Congress is taking urgent action to support federal agencies, state and local government uh, as we uh, take on this pandemic uh, and ensure that working families get the help uh, that they need. Uh, thus, thus far, Congress has passed two bipartisan packages uh, to primarily help public, to help public health officials uh, and to help families cushion the economic blow, families and small businesses. Uh, Congress is working on a third package that I'm sure you've heard a lot about, uh, and that's going to provide additional economic assistance to families, uh, to businesses, large and small, uh, and to help our hospitals, frontline health workers, uh, and first responders. As of today, as you heard, Maryland has confirmed 190 cases of coronavirus, and that number is 15 confirmed uh, in Anne Arundel uh, County. So what has Congress been doing? Two weeks ago, uh, we passed an emergency $8.3 billion uh, aid or spending bill. Uh, this bill includes more than $3 billion uh, for research and development for vac vaccines, uh, therapeutics, and diagnostics. Uh, it includes more than $2 billion for prevention, preparedness, and response. And of that, about half, $950 million, goes directly to the states. And on Monday, Maryland received a proportionate uh, um, amount about almost $11 million, uh, and that went from uh, the CDC to MEMA, and then MEMA, which is a Maryland Emergency Management uh, Administration, will work with counties uh, on the allocation of those uh, resources, all of that for testing, tracking, uh, and raising uh, public awareness on uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, you should know that your federal, state, and local officials in partnerships with hospitals are exploring all avenues to expand testing in Maryland, as the, uh, your public health officer mentioned, including uh, standing up a drive-by and on-site uh, testing. Uh, that $8.3 billion package uh, also includes $1 billion uh, for procurement of pharmaceuticals and medical supplies, and those dollars will be part of what will be used uh, to support county government, uh, as the county executive mentioned, as you're looking at hospital capacity, uh, PPE, um, and the ability to take on a, a medical uh, surge. Um, and uh, $7 billion uh, of that package is uh, for low-interest loans uh, to small businesses. The Small Business Administration 
um, has uh, certified uh, Maryland and all small businesses in Maryland uh, to apply for small business loans. Uh, these are up to $2 million. Uh, once you receive your loan, uh, you have one year before you have to make your first payment. The interest rates are 3.75% for a business, 2.75% for a nonprofit, and the, and, the, and the loan proceeds are to be used essentially for working uh, capital. Um, this week, the second thing that Congress did, uh, we passed legislation to soften the economic impact primarily on families. Uh, two weeks of paid sick leave and 10 weeks of paid family leave at small and medium-sized businesses. The sick leave is if you are ill, quarantined or seeking diagnosis or preventative care for coronavirus or, uh, or COVID-19, or if you are caring for a sick family member. The paid family leave is for parents whose children are at home because of a closing for a school or a daycare center. It's my hope in the third package we expand that, uh, but that's our current state of play. Uh, in, in what we did this week, we also strengthened unemployment program here in Maryland. This includes employees of federal contractors, hourly workers, service sector employees in Anne Arundel County, and including public sector employees at every level of government. Um, and our action also included um, um, having the states, and Maryland is doing it, waiving the waiting period uh, and the work search requirement for unemployment insurance uh, benefits. Uh, the second package also supports state and local efforts to combat food insecurity. And you've heard about some of those efforts from the county executive covering uh, cost of feeding kids and families and seniors, ensuring that everyone who needs food assistance through SNAP and WIC get it. Um, and this will benefit nearly 36,000 SNAP beneficiaries in Anne Arundel County. And it also supports the Anne Arundel County Public Schools to continue serving the grab and go meals to students, which I understand has now expanded to 52 locations uh, this week. Uh, it also supports the Anne Arundel County Food Bank, uh, which has expanded their mobile food pantries to help our communities during this difficult period. And finally, we ensure that everyone who needs a test um, uh, will uh, be able to get a test without paying for it. But as the public health officer mentioned, uh, tests are not uh, online at the level that we need them to be. And we continue to work at the state, federal, and local level to increase testing capacity. But you should know that whether you're insured or not, whether you are documented, your presence in this country or not, um, cost should not be a factor in whether you get, it is not a factor in whether you get uh, a test. My priorities going forward um, briefly, um, in this, particularly as we look at this third package, um, supporting small businesses and workers impacted by the crisis, um, supporting our county executive and governor so they can continue doing the good work that they and their teams are doing, um, uh, uh, supporting families, and that's going to be big in the third package. Uh, yes, we have to um, um, essentially save big corporations, but we have to make sure that the employees um, are going to be benefited. We have extended the July 5th, I'm sorry, the president has extended to July 15th, the filing deadline for uh, taxes, and you should know that all student loans, um, the payments have been suspended, uh, federally guaranteed student loans, for 60 days. Um, so uh, with that, I'll be here for the question and answer uh, period, uh, and um, uh, look forward to continue working with your team, Mr. County Executive, uh, as, we, as we work our way through this uh, very difficult period. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Sarah Elfrith. I serve as the Senator for District 30. That is the Annapolis and South County area. I first want to thank the County Executive for inviting me here today to talk a little bit about what the General Assembly and the state are working on. I'd also like to thank our governor for taking decisive action in this very difficult time to keep Marylanders safe. You may have, may have read that the General Assembly adjourned early from our 90-day legislative session for the first time since the Civil War on Wednesday. We did so for a number of reasons. It was imperative that the 188 members of the legislature got back to our districts and focused on our constituents and our community. It's also important that the governor uh, should focus primarily and essentially on uh, responding to this crisis. Before we adjourned, we passed a number of important pieces of legislation that I wanted to briefly highlight today. 
Number one, we passed uh, our constitutional obligation, a balanced and, uh, and responsible budget. That was done so bipartisanly and unanimously in the Senate. And uh, apart from making sure that government is running through uh, not just the end of this fiscal year, but uh, the fiscal year beginning on July 1st, uh, that also freed up $350 million for Governor Hogan to use to, indirect, to directly respond to this crisis. Uh, in that $350 million is $50 million from the Rainy Day Fund um, that he can use immediately uh, to ensure that uh, we continue to serve the constituents of Maryland. We also passed emergency legislation, Senate Bill 1080, I think it's the most important piece of legislation I ever voted on, um, to directly address the COVID crisis. It does a number of things from reducing barriers to screening tests as they come online. It improves telehealth, which is something that I, I hear quite often from constituents about the ability to access uh, necessary and critical health care, mental health care through telehealth. Uh, it prohibits price gouging, and our attorney general is working very hard to make sure that uh, we are not paying $50 for uh, a case of water right now. It, the bill ensures people under quarantine cannot lose their jobs, and most importantly, it expands unemployment insurance to those who have an employer who ceases to operations due to the, the crisis, uh, those who are in, in quarantine, those who have to leave work to take care of sick family members, or if they themselves um, need to be quarantined. We passed a number of important um, telehealth bills, Senate Bill 502 and Senate Bill 402, that uh, should be coming online as soon as the governor signs them. Important to thank the governor, uh, the Senate president and Speaker of the House for signing Senate Bill 1080 on, on Thursday. That was emergency legislation that went into immediate effect. Um, we also, before adjourning on Wednesday, stood up a special COVID-19 work group of senators and delegates to make sure that we are uh, tracking, the legislature is tracking what is going on in real time. And so when we do come back for a special session in late May to help um, continue the good work that we did during the session, that we have an idea and a game plan moving forward. I want to specifically thank everybody who's reached out um, over email. My staff and I are working remotely. I may not be in the State House, but we are working around the clock to answer your questions, whether it is it comes to clarifying uh, or getting answers for you on the governor's executive orders, clarifying on, on telehealth uh, issues, uh, working with you to cut through the red tape of unemployment insurance. Um, we are here to serve you. And so I'm just going to ask that you continue to reach out to us. I am so impressed, and I think this crisis has shown the importance of collaboration, not just between county, state, and federal uh, elected officials, but most importantly, our collaboration with the public. It was mentioned before, but I want to reiterate that we cannot do our jobs if we don't hear from you, if we don't uh, aren't aware of what's going on in every single community and are being responsive to you. The best ideas we're getting right now of how this crisis is impacting your life is coming from the public, and I need to hear your ideas, your questions, your feedback, so we can in turn get those to the governor, or get those to the appropriate uh, uh, agency within state government. So I'm going to continue to ask you to do that, especially since we are coming back in May with a special session um, to take care of, of all that we need to, to work on. Um, I will be spending uh, the next couple of weeks uh, answering constituent emails, making sure that uh, our county executive has all that he needs, our schools and our children have all that they need, um, painting the front porch, reading a few books, and answering every single email that comes into my inbox. But I just want to thank everybody for paying, for listening today um, and continuing to be an active participant in keeping Maryland safe. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Elford. Thank you, everybody. Those were very thorough. Um, before we get started, it might be a really good idea if I turn my phone off. Okay. So let's get started with the series of questions on the center on testing. Many of our questions were in this area. How can I be tested? Where can I go? Are the tests free? Um, Dr. Kalia Nariman, would you begin by explaining, can you describe what a drive-through testing site would actually look like? Most of us have only gone through, you know, McDonald's. <laughs> little different, I hope. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we are trying to make sure that we accomplish is how do we test those people who have symptoms for this? And in this setting, also who have severe enough symptoms. Um, as we talked about before, there aren't enough tests at this moment. So 
what we want to do is identify those with severe symptoms, so people with shortness of breath, people with persistent fevers, and we generally think of that as over 72 hours, who need testing, and then how do we get them the testing they need? A drive-through testing site is literally that. You, you call ahead, you have an order for testing, um, and that is, we are actively working on that. Um, and when you have an you get an appointment, and then you literally go to the place where you're told to go, you drive through, somebody will, a nurse typically, will use the swab, put it in your nose, because that's how the testing is done, while you're sitting in your car. You don't get out of your car. But put that swab in your nose, put it in the test kit, and then you drive away. So what that does is it limits your interaction with anybody else so that we can decrease the spread of this, but also gets you the testing that you need because there are decisions that we need to make around isolation, quarantine, and whether you need additional care. So it is very much a uh, fast food drive-through style. So we've heard hospitals in the county reporting that it takes as long as uh, six days to get the results. Is there anything that can be done to speed that up? So right now that delay is happening because there are, there are so many tests being done that and there aren't enough test equipment to run it fast enough. And so there's a backlog of processing. We're hearing up to six days. Typically it's running at around three to four days turnaround. As more labs come online, that should increase the speed with which we're able to do them. But what we anticipate is that more people will get tested. So. This is a, it's a game of trying to catch up with as many tests that we try to do. Can we make sure we can process them? And that's really the delay uh, that we're seeing. So if someone is feeling sick, at what point should they go to the emergency room? So if you have life-threatening symptoms, um, you're having chest pain, you're having difficulty breathing, and you're not able to catch your breath, uh, then we would recommend that you go to the emergency room. However, before you reach that point, please call your primary care doctor. If you don't have one, call the health department so that we can screen you, assess what the next step is, and then determine whether your symptoms are mild enough to be able to stay home and isolate while we monitor, or whether they are severe enough that requires uh, a visit to either urgent care or a hospital setting for further evaluation. One thing we want to point out is that not everything um, that is cough, fever, short of breath is COVID-19. Flu, it is still flu season. And so we do want to make that assessment as much as we can um, by phone before asking you to travel. Which brings us to our next questions about hospitals and medical centers. The COVID-19 outbreak exposed some really surprising weaknesses in the health system. Um, the rollout of testing has been patchy, in your words, uh, and government and private labs have had to scale up in order to um, build the capacity to create these the thousands of tests that, that are going to be necessary. Um, and of course, more testing is going to mean more hospitalizations. Can we discuss what plans are in place at all levels of government for hospitals and urgent care facilities if we see a spiked increase in COVID-19 cases within our county and within the country? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll begin with that, but I will turn it over to, to the other panelists as well on that. Um, the hospitals in this county, in the state, and, and around the country are working on their, what we call our surge capacity. So the ability to increase the number of hospital beds increase the number of ICU beds, and increase the number of ventilators so that we're able to meet the demand that is coming. And so what that's led to is cancellation of elective surgeries, turning, um, turning ORs into hospital rooms, turning recovery into hospital rooms, converting doctor's offices into urgent care centers. And so it's really this massive shift of what our current operations are towards how we meet that surge capacity. Let me add, if I can, that uh, there are a few things at the federal level that we can push on to assist state and local governments on expanding that surge capacity. I mentioned the, initially some of the dollars in that $8.3 billion but, uh, package, that first package. But there are a few things. 
Uh, the president mentioned using the Defense um, 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 a Production Act, which essentially gives the federal government the uh, authority to direct industry to manufacture whatever we need. In this case, ventilators, uh, respirators, the N95. Uh, in a phone call with uh, Governor Hogan yesterday, um, he is he is very much interested, as all we are all, to mobilize Maryland's private sector. We've got a lot of great light manufacturers that could help in this. So we're urging uh, the president to uh, to accelerate uh, the 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 use of the uh, Defense Production Act. The other piece, uh, and it's already happening in Maryland, the Maryland National Guard. Um, I think 2,200. That may be a little high. I, I, let me strike that number. Uh, National Guards around the country, including in Maryland, have been mobilized, and they are assisting uh, local hospitals in um, uh, adapting, if you will, the, the facilities for uh, surge capacity. We are calling on, and will include in the third package, uh, um, putting those National Guard members on Title 32 status. I don't want to get into the weeds, but that essentially shifts the cost of that mobilization to the federal government so that the state government can spend the money on, on other things. The, the governor will still have control of the National Guard, but the federal government should pick up the capacity. And then the final piece I'll say is we're looking at ways to more uh, uh, engage the Army Corps of Engineers also in building out retrofitting uh, facilities uh, for health care. You know, I would just say on this, this isn't a direct answer to the question on the hospitals, but the way that we're operating in this environment, it's, it's, I've found that it's very important to stay in your lane. So I would love to pick up the phone and call the medical centers and say, what are you doing? Come on, let's figure out, th let's figure this out. And, and um, but Dr. Kalyan Arman is in contact with them and, uh, and this emergency operations center and the joint information uh, center here as well um, are doing those things. And, and we're all, we're all trying to, um, let each other do our jobs and um, restrict our communications sometimes. <laughs> I know Dr. K here is, I, I, um, I try not to text him too often um, because I know he's inundated. And, um, um, and that's, that's, that's been something that, that um, I think we're doing well. I mean, the worst thing that can happen is that all of government starts stepping all over each other. And, and um, um, it's great that we have a system uh, to be able to do it. Uh, stay in our lanes. Thank you. So let's talk about our children. Um, I think some of us were just shocked that COVID-19 could claim the lives of both an infant and a teenager in China. Um, based on the available evidence, are children at a higher risk for COVID-19 than adults? So what we see is that the, the most vulnerable groups are those who are um, older, over the age of 60, those with chronic illnesses, and children have actually generally been, uh, generally been spared from this. There are, there, are, uh, there are obviously cases in Maryland and throughout the country of children getting this, but, the, but they, tend not to, they tend not to have severe consequences, and there's very, very few deaths in the, in the childhood population. So um, we, what we're really focusing on is how do, we, how do we take that information and use it to make sure that children are also, because they tend not to have symptoms or very mild symptoms, that we're still cognizant of how we are making sure that they're not spreading COVID-19 to others who are at higher risk. What should we say to them? How do we talk to them about social distancing? Is it safe for them to play outside? Um, should play dates be discouraged? Yeah, this is a this is a question we get a lot, and we've had to. I've had to have this conversation with my kids, with my wife as well. Um, talk to your children and ask them what they know. They hear stuff. Uh, as 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 any any parent knows, your children know a lot more than you think they know. Um, and so start talking to them about it. They certainly understand the idea of colds, if they're old enough, of course, of colds and washing their hands and wiping their nose and trying not to get others infected. And this is really in the, in the same conversation, uh, same line of conversation as that. Children still need to play. And what we're recommending is that you find a few, you know, two, three, maybe four at most, friends that they are consistently playing with. And so that they're not, their networks are closing down, but are not eliminated. Um, I'm, I'm, sure that, I'm sure that all of you with children know that there's only so much you can do to control them. And if you have 
Uh, if you have children at home all day, you need them to get out of the house and do something, particularly as we're entering spring. And so limit that circle of friends that your children are playing with and definitely do it outside. I, I would chime in as a, as a parent as well uh, on the need to talk to our kids and listen to our kids. Um, they read things on the internet and, and there's a lot on the internet that um, is not true. And um, this is going to this crisis is going to define their lives. It's going to be something that they're going to be looking back on, and and their view of the world is going to depend largely on how they view what goes on here. And so, listening to them and talking to them, um, making sure they have the facts. But um, um, I think that's that's key. It's an opportunity to to connect with our kids. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, this county resident is looking for guidance about daycares. Um, she asked, I understand the state is reluctant to close them due to the needs of health care workers and others working outside their homes, but for those of us who can keep the kids home, but where daycares are still open, what should we do? If you can keep your children home, do that. Um, that helps promote the social distancing that we're talking about. Um, and this is where our individual actions help. So as much as each of us can do, um, every single one of those steps is going to help. That said, there are people who do need to go to work and do need to, uh, are either healthcare workers or essential personnel or working in other types of work uh, critical to respond to this crisis. Um, and so we do have guidance that's been put out for daycares on how to, uh, how to limit the spread of infection how to have small enough groups, as I was mentioning, closing down your circle of contacts, having small enough groups um, so that there's just fewer children coming into contact with each other. And then this is the part where parents play a great role. We have all sent our child to school or to daycare with symptoms and tried to get away with it. This is the time that you can't do that. If your child has any sorts of symptoms of illness, please keep them at home. That is the part that you can do. I know that is hard, um, but as the other panelists, as Congressman and State Senator have noted, there are efforts to be able to protect your job and also to provide income relief during that. Uh, It depends on your situation, but keep your kids at home if they are sick, even with the slightest symptoms. Does anyone know whether or not there's a coordinated effort uh, to arrange childcare for healthcare workers whose kids are at home now? There is, and um, there was, um, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the locations for those. And of course, they need to be small. They need to be in groups of, of 10 or less. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we've had various, various options going around. Um, you know, one is to use the schools where, where Rec and Parks has been doing, uh, has been doing childcare, and uh, the school rooms where there's outside access. Schools are making a big effort to clean their buildings right now. Uh, so um, we're still talking to the state about that. Um, they control access to the schools through the state school superintendent. Um, we, um, our economic development department has been talking to the child care centers and they report that far fewer kids are coming in. Uh, some of them are, are staying open and, and um, have smaller numbers. So there's the possibility of engaging those child care centers to fill that need um, and contract with them and do, do vouchers for our first responder kids and healthcare workers kids. Um, but we're gonna be standing up our first next week. And um, you know, through the Rec-, Rec and Parks Department, we're gonna be reaching out to those employees to provide the service where it's needed. That's great. Um, so turning to our seniors, is it safe for over 65 age adults to be around children? What other precautions should older adults be taking? This is a hard one. So it's. Generally, um, generally, we're asking those who are those who are at higher risk, so not just those who are older, but also those with chronic illness, um, to limit their contact as much as possible with others. Um, the particular challenge with children is that they like to hug their grandparents, uh, but also the other part of it is that children, generally, for the uh, for those people with COVID nineteen, if a child gets it, they tend to have fewer symptoms, which makes it more challenging to be able to say, if you have symptoms, don't interact, they don't have as many symptoms. And so what we're really advocating is that find other ways to connect with your, uh, connect with children, 
if you can, obviously phone, uh, things like Skype, FaceTime, other ways to do video chat um, are really key. It's really hard because the social distancing also leads to social isolation. And so trying to balance those two uh, is the challenge that we all face in the coming weeks and months. Anyone else? So uh, lots of folks seem convinced that they need to hoard food. And they're afraid of grocery stores closing or running out of items. So is there anything that anyone can say to reassure folks that hoarding really isn't necessary? That, that's been a clear message at every level of government. Uh, the, the, um, the governor has said that. I have said that. The president has said that. Everybody's saying, um, don't hoard food because you're preventing other people from getting whatever it is that you're hoarding, and there's no reason to believe that there's going to be a shortage of food. Um, so um, uh, there is an issue about too many people being in a grocery store at once, and I know that, that some of the chains have made a wise decision to do their cleaning at night, uh, let seniors in first thing in the morning. Um, you can check with the grocery stores on, on which have which policies um, so that the seniors aren't being exposed to everybody else. But uh, the, the, the supply of food is there. Yeah, let me add, I was on a conference call yesterday and um, um, had a briefing from the chairman of the House um, Committee on Agriculture who's been in constant uh, communications with growers and producers and distributors uh, and what the county executive is saying is very accurate. Uh, there, there is not a, a, a crisis in the, the supply of food stuff. Um, and um, transportation is a cr critical infrastructure, so there will continue to be a flow of goods uh, uh, throughout this country. Um, agriculture is critical as well. Um, none of the producers or distributors are reporting a shortage of, of people to do the work. Uh, so at this point, um, uh, there is no need to hoard uh, because while you may go into a store today and see a shortage on the shelf, it's mostly because people are hoarding, not because the supply is not there. So if you are going in and, and, and shopping at the, at the normal, perhaps a slight plus up in what you would normally purchase, um, that, that, that is what is recommended uh, so that the shelves continue to be stocked for everybody. I'd also like to add uh, this crisis has highlighted a, a problem in, in, our, in our state, which is we have 200,000 children, young people, who live in food insecure homes. And so I'd just like to reemphasize that our uh, Anne Arundel County public school system, our state school system, are just heroes in this circumstance by expanding the free lunch program to include free breakfast and free dinner. And so I'd like to thank the state superintendent of schools for applying for the federal waiver to allow our schools to do that, and for all of our school employees who are working hard to ensure that children at this time have access to three meals a day, just critically, critically important. And as a farmer, I gotta put in a plug here. <laughs> you can grow your own food. So <laughs> the garden centers, the garden centers are open. You can get your seeds, you can get your, your, your plants, and uh, even if you're growing some tomatoes in a pot, uh, it's, it's a great experience, it's fun for the families, and uh, um, then you know you'll have fresh vegetables. <laughs> Has anybody heard anything about uh, expected updates on when we'll hear if schools are reopening or not? We have not been notified. Um, I think that there is no likely scenario that schools will be reopening in a week. Um, I think we're just waiting for the announcement uh, that it's gonna be an extended period. Would that be accurate? I would think so, yes. Okay. I think we have a, a governor who is making sure that we are staying constantly updated with the status of what's going on across the state. Uh, and I just wanna reiterate that uh, he's doing a wonderful job at keeping the lines of communication open um, and, you know, with his uh, press conferences every few days, I think it's very helpful right now that we're looking out for what's, what's coming ahead. And we should note that the uh, University System of Maryland, uh, the chancellor, uh, put out either yesterday or the day before uh, a notice uh, that um, students will not be returning to classes, uh, physical classrooms for the remainder of the spring semester, uh, and that uh, they can expect uh, to receive instruction uh, online. Um, for the professional schools, they're still working out those details and how to deliver that, that uh, education, that instruction, according to the professional standards and requirements. But for undergraduates in Maryland, Maryland uh, public universities and colleges, they will not be returning 
to the classroom after spring break. I, I would just like to second what uh, Senator Elfer said about the governor and his team that, that as the county executives have communicated about next steps and, and needs, uh, the, the governor's office has been right there at about the same time um, in the same place making the same decisions and, and in, in, in some cases we've actually made recommendations like the mall closures, everybody, we were concerned that malls were open and that they would become a gathering place and uh, so the governor responded. Um, but um, he's been very clear, very, very decisive, and it's exactly what we need. Here's a good idea that um, someone would like me to mention. Is it possible to set up drop-off bins by the entrance of county buildings to continue services like deed processing and permit applications? It's interesting that that question is asked. Um, those offices are continuing to operate, although people are, are working from home at times. And we have closed county buildings to the public. And so that's why the question arose. And the answer is that they are working as we speak uh, on setting up such a, such a drop box in inspections and permits. So of all the folks that are in their homes with maybe perhaps more time on their hands than they're accustomed to, um, is it a good idea for people to sew masks for health workers, healthcare workers? Is there is there any kind of pattern? We've we've seen these things advertised. There's a lot of so. Uh, this question comes from the recommendation either yesterday or the day before from the CDC. We're looking into how effective that actually could be. I want to note that a shortage of PPE, personal protective equipment, is the driver behind that and so I'm going to make a pitch that for all of those businesses and the county executive mentioned too who made really generous donations of masks for all of those businesses who have supplies um, that could be used in the healthcare industry please reach out to us no matter where you are um, and, and make those donations those are critical um, we're going to be looking at that mask recommendation and we also know that industries are looking to shift their production towards that um, I just got some text today about 3D printing. Um, there's a lot of really interesting innovation going on, and it's moving so fast that all of us are having trouble keeping up with it. But, but those are the kind of ideas that I think are going to keep blossoming. So uh, keep at it. 410-222-0600. That's the number to call to make your donations. <laughs> Aside from staying home, um, is there anything that uh, we can advise county residents to do to make sure that the people who are out as trash collectors and first responders and anybody that's interacting with the public, how, how, can, how can we help them stay safe and still able to continue providing all these services that we need? I'm sorry, I was reading a text message saying that we're just running out of time, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> from my, from my calculation, sure we we've got 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I How much, what do they say? 12.04, that clock doesn't, <laughs> doesn't work. Okay. But, um, yeah, it's 12.04. Um, Chris, what was that question Chris, but, um, Chris gave us till 12.15, so we have a little extra time. Okay, okay. I can we'll jump, keep, I think an important thing to do right now is to make sure that we're all kind to one another. And I, I want to thank the, you know, we, we didn't consider folks who work at our grocery stores or our gas stations essential personnel before, but this crisis has really shown that they are doing just essential, essential work to keep our communities going. So just being kind to one another, um, not be rude if something is out of stock to a, a grocer or, or you know, an extra thank you to the folks who are making sure that our, our society is running a, along. I think that's gonna go a long way in the, in the weeks ahead. So finally, and we are getting to the end of our time, some of, this, some of these are questions that, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a generous spirit in the community that needs an outlet, people want to volunteer, people want to donate. Um, what should they do? What should they bring? What do we need? Well, there, we, we were just talked about donating, um, donating product, donating supplies, uh, and, and that um, we need, uh, that will be sorted. Um, uh, 
But in addition to that, there's, there's volunteering your time. Mm -hmm. And so you can call the same number and they're collecting information uh, about who's available to do what. You can email that eoc at aacounty.org and, um, and let us know that you're available, when you're available, um, you know, whether you have a vehicle that you can help with, because I know driving is, is, is likely to be an issue, and what skills you might have. And then they're sorting through all of that and getting it to the appropriate agencies. So, um, uh, there, and, and it also to the appropriate nonprofit organizations. Mm -hmm. So the, the best way to do it is to do it through that EOC email or phone number. If I could add just two, two other avenues to, to volunteer your time. The Anne Arundel County Food Bank um, has always been an essential part of our community and now more than ever to ensure that we have food going to the folks who need the most. So uh, donating, reaching out to them and donating your, your time if you're healthy and available or donating uh, non-perishable food items to the food bank is really important right now. And Anne Arundel Connecting Together is a, is a network of uh, faith organizations that are working to make sure that the most vulnerable in our communities um, have access to, to everything they need. So I'd recommend those two organizations. And then one other that I would recommend, um, feedingamerica.org, which supports the Anne Arundel Food Bank and food banks across the country. Um, if your contribution is in the form of, of dollars, you can go to their website, feedingamerica.org, uh, and uh, donate money. And I would just I would just thank and commend everybody who's who's doing this work. I last week after this town hall, I went to Glen Burnie behind Buster's Ice Cream in the parking lot. A group uh, of volunteers that call themselves Be Kind uh, was was passing out food. They do it every Saturday, and and they weren't slowing down as a result of this. And um, uh, I, I saw on Facebook one person who actually, with her kids in her garage, had put together food packages and gone to one of the school food distribution sites and had signs on their car that their kids had made in English and Spanish. Um, offering uh, food as well as diapers and other supplies uh, to just anybody who walked up. Um, so it's amazing what people can do when they, when they put their minds to it. Um, and finally, because this is a rare occasion in that we have three levels of government represented here, um, many people are suffering loss of income and they're gonna have difficulty paying their bills and buying essentials. Uh, what can be done in cooperation at the county, state, and federal level to provide relief for these folks? The feds provide the resources. Y'all yeah. put the money, and right? Look, I mean, and <laughs> the, 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 the most important thing that the federal government can do is, one, is to uh, appropriate money for individuals and families and for state and county government to, 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 to pass the authorizations, the tools, the, the empower them to do it, and essentially get out of the way. Um, and uh, what is happening at the state and, and, and local level across this country has been phenomenal. Um, so again, just to recap though, we, we've, we've enhanced the sick leave and the, and the uh, family medical leave. We're going to go back and hopefully do more. We've, um, uh, we've strengthened the unemployment insurance benefit and that whole program. We're going to go back and do more. Um, small businesses um, and, and large businesses, that's the next round supporting businesses who support employees. Our approach will be employee centric. So when we're supporting, uh, let's say, uh, American Airlines or Southwest Airlines, which has a hub at BWI, uh, Thurgood Marshall Airport. It's not, it's not just for, for Southwest as a corporation, but it's for the men and women who work at Southwest to make sure that the support that goes to that airline goes right to their employees, keeps them on payroll, keeps their health care benefits going. That's our, gonna be our focus. We also, the governor and the county executive can speak more to this as well, uh, ensure that uh, essential utilities, our BGE, our, our cable, uh, internet, uh, will not be shut down. Uh, and I don't believe they'll be collecting late fees at this time either. I'm not sure of the time period on that, but I think it's safe to say that it will be extended throughout uh, however long this will take. So making sure utilities that we're all paying every month stay online and aren't be going and charging late fees is, is essential. And, and I would just thank the person for asking that question. Uh, when we asked Dr. Kelly and Arman what county government outside of the health department should be focused on, his answer was, was exactly what we expected, which is the most vulnerable people, is pay attention to who's getting impacted, who's being hurt, and, and figure out a way to help those people. And, and it's partly a logistics um, effort. Uh, it's, I did say something about the money coming from the federal government. It doesn't all come from the federal government. We do have, to have county funds and, and emergency funds, 
and we're looking at ways of, of engaging those as well. Um, and then we're keeping track of everything that we do because this is, a, is an emergency um, so that we can, uh, we hope we'll get some federal reimbursement for some of what we put out on the streets as we go because we have to balance our budget every year and keep government running. Any final thoughts? I have a final thought. Um, and uh, Dr. K talked about social distancing and I constantly remind people that in the absence of a vaccine, and we're working on it, in the absence of a vaccine, the best medicine we have is social distancing. You took my line. <laughs> Absolutely. That concludes our town hall, unless you would like to make any. That concludes our town hall, so thank you very much for joining us.